Let's talk about Moon Knight. Look, I know, the only thing you're more exhausted with than the MCU is probably hearing me talk about each new project that drops on Disney+. Plus. The uneven quality post-Endgame hasn't helped either, in my opinion. For every Black Widow, I know, hot take, go ahead, crucify me, there's been an Eternals. For every Loki, there's been a Falcon in the Winter Soldier. And then we have WandaVision, which is like, you know, mostly great until it shits the bed in the finale. Will that up and down swing of quality be the norm moving forward? Who's to tell? But for now, at least we can revel in the fact that Moon Knight f***ing rules. And yeah, when things first kicked off and I was treated to Oscar Isaac's fake English accent as Stephen Grant, I wasn't immediately sure how I felt either. Hello. But by the end of that first episode, thanks to a magnificent Children of Men style car chase and our first proper glimpse at the titular superhero as he marched towards the camera, yeah, I was hooked. I was in, and a lot of that has to do with Oscar Isaac, but a lot of that also has to do with the incredible direction and story team involved, namely Mohamed Diab and Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. But let's get this straight, it wasn't just the pulse-pounding action that had me engaged, it was the fact that Moon Knight doesn't feel like an MCU entry. I mean, sure, yeah, there's the occasional misplaced MCU joke or the in-house aesthetic flourishes, but thankfully, there's not too much of that, and Moon Knight mostly feels like its own thing. I'd almost go on to say as it feels entirely like its own thing, and it's also a compelling yet compassionate story about mental illness, one that approaches the issue tastefully and makes its lead character more sympathetic and one who you'll have an additional reason to root for. I mean, Stephen Grant and Mark Spector are put through absolute hell here. They're entering repeated dissociative states, waking up in random places. It's a lot to take in. I mean, imagine if you were losing entire hours of your day, of your life at a time, and when you came to, you've had relationships or even your career ruined you'd probably be tempted to break veganism and order a nice bottle of wine for yourself. Well, no need to book a table at a fancy restaurant, Bright Cellars has you covered. Bright Cellars is a monthly wine membership that determines your taste profile and recommends the ideal wines for you, so you can also relish in the nectar of the gods. With Mother's Day coming up and National Wine Day only a couple weeks later, May is the best month to try out Bright Cellars. Get matched with wines all around the globe curated to your palate, with every box being handpicked by their in-house experts. It's the perfect way to try new wines you've never tasted before. I mean, look, before I tried Bright Cellars, I was an uncultured schmuck who just grabbed the first bottle of red-colored god juice I saw off the shelves, uncorked the bottle, and thought, oh yeah, that's good, I might as well go with that. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, and I only live a few hours away from f***ing wine country in Southern California. Ever since I took Bright Cellars' seven-question quiz to determine my ideal wines and made my first order, I feel like I've been imbued with the power of Konshu himself, impressing even the most pretentious of my wine connoisseur friends. I've particularly taken to Nihilist Wine Company's Cabernet and Cactus Park's Red Blend, and it's been great having the bottles delivered right to my door each month. I've also unlocked the endless possibilities of the wine multiverse thanks to the wine education cards that come with each bottle, with suggested pairings, origins, and other tasting notes. So check out the link in the description below to get 50% off your first six bottle box and let Bright Cellars help you discover wines you love. And thank you so much to Bright Sellers for sponsoring this video. Moon Knight, more than any of the other Disney Plus shows, perhaps more than any other MCU entry period, doesn't just excel because of its storytelling, or its acting, or visual spectacle. Let me clarify, it does excel at those things, particularly with acting, thanks to Oscar Isaac coming in with a holy shit, this might be the best in the entire MCU level performance, but what sets Moon Knight apart is how it seems to have almost zero interest in merely expanding the MCU. That's really secondary, hell, it might even be third, it's really in the back of their minds in terms of this show. It's refreshing. Moon Knight is interested in telling its story, not that of a larger franchise. Now, I don't know if this was Jeremy Slater's call from the beginning, if Mojave Diab brought it up, or if Kevin Feige realized that the best way to get someone to tune in is to not make them feel obligated to see the setup for four different movies down the line, but it's the fundamental element of Moon Knight's success. That's not to say it's trying to disregard the MCU, though. It definitely isn't, and you can feel some of the MCU-isms as the show goes along. Granted, they are 
far less egregious than what we've seen before. But most importantly, this show is certainly not disregarding its roots in comics. The show starts off on a very similar note to that of Warren Ellis' Moon Knight run. There's an emphasis on servitude, on it being some sort of awesome responsibility rooted in worship. The premise that mankind is in an almost perversely intimate pairing with a god he will never be good or powerful enough to comprehend. It's like Moon Knight represents a malevolent god, one that sees himself as above his subjects and fully willing to dispose of or ruin them for his own gains. The extent of Conchu's ruthlessness is certainly up for debate, but he still uses people for his own desires and often has little to no remorse for what fate might await those whose bodies he inhabits. He's aided by the devotion many have to him, the almost cult-like way that a religion or belief can organize itself within groups of people, terrifying them to stray from their absolute devotion. This causes Mark Spector's mind to fracture, even worse than it was before Khonshu came into his life. Mark might have been willing to assist Khonshu, but he was also taken advantage of. As soon as he gave Khonshu an inch, Khonshu took miles. Ellis's run of Moon Knight comics is about Mark coming to terms with the power Khonshu gave him, to give in to it rather than futilely resist the permanence with which it is bonded to him, and to do better, to change the world through it. Mark Spector surrenders to devotion in Ellis's run, as he does for the first four, or three and a half at least, episodes of Moon Knight, the show, and then the series shifts to adapt pieces of Jeff Lemire's run in episode four onwards. The show, like Lemire's comics, begins to analyze Mark Spector's conscience and psyche. What is real or sense, and what is unreal or nonsense? Where does Mark Spector end and where does Khonshu begin? In Lemire's run and the back half of the show, Mark learns to fight to accept all the different parts of himself. So really, Mark isn't a hero. He's a guy being used, being lied to, about being a hero, and his journey is learning to accept that he is what makes Moon Knight Moon Knight, not Khonshu. You are the only real superpower I ever had. When he finally accepts that, he becomes a hero. It's fascinating how many of the MCU heroes are called to heroism and choose to serve. And then here comes Mark Spector, who is the antithesis to many of the MCU heroes. By having us view the experiences through the lens of Stephen Grant, acting as the audience surrogate, we're able to experience his hardships, his pain, the fact that his only way out is to give in as his mind is hijacked by Mark and, by extension, Khonshu. It's only once Steven and Mark learn to become one, separate from Khonshu, that his fractured mind can become one. He has to build himself back up after his powers split him apart. Moon Knight also takes inspiration from Egyptian mythology. That's not as common a well to tap in these days. Greek and even Norse mythology seem to be all the rage with modern screenwriters, but within the MCU, mythology in general isn't unique to Moon Knight. It is, however, explored and played with on a deeply sophisticated level here, whereas other MCU entries, such as Thor, incorporated mythology on an elementary level, even just aesthetic level. Hell, mythology is all over Eternals, yet I'd be generous to say it's even explored at an infantile level with such on-the-nose nonsense as a character named Icarus literally flying into the sun. In short, the MCU to date hasn't truly explored mythology. Rather, it's just paid lip service to it. Moon Knight hasn't got time for that. Its storytelling has a lot more to offer between the lines, if you want to look that deep. For people who just want the story and want an entertaining show, Moon Knight also works on that level. The entire dramatic core of the series is derived from Egyptian mythology. Mark Spector and his personalities are the mummy resurrected by Khonshu in order to execute his will on Earth. It was done so against Mark's will, or really by bending Mark's will. That ties back into how he's burdened by servitude and cursed by it. On another level, Mark is a Jewish protagonist who is manipulated and exploited by an Egyptian god, giving that commentary on servitude and enslavement another layer. That idea carries from episode one all the way through episode six. To sum it up, we're not just using the Bifrost because it looks cool and has a cool name, <coughs> Thor. <coughs> 
excuse me, whew, Moon Knight is instead interested in the full text of the Poetic Edda, or rather in this case, the Book of the Dead. You can even look at this politically, with the scales of justice being tipped in favor of either Khonshu or Amit. They're both working to push their agenda onto the common person, when really, all that person wants is help. They just want someone who's in a position of power to do what's going to benefit them, the people they govern or serve, instead of their own self-interests, and we see the blowback from that. Harrow is the extremist, the one who holds absolute rigid to the world faith in Amit. He takes things into his own hands, he's even willing to shift his allegiance to blindly follow those who empower him, without a care as to how malicious their motivations may be. Khonshu punishes people after the crime, whereas Amit acts like a precog. But the trade-off is Khonshu still takes advantage of fragile-minded people. For him, just like with Amit and even Haro, the ends justify the means, and he can go, oh hey look, I did a bad thing, but we stopped this even worse thing from happening. So it's all good. But at least Haro, because he was burnt and taken advantage of in a similar way, wants to prevent others from being used the same way that Khonshu has used so many. He's been pushed to extremism in the other direction. So he's become an ambassador of the whole pre-crime phenomenon centered around Amit. Haro is a man working to atone for his work with Khonshu, a man constantly walking around in pain. It's not a mistake that the very first thing we see in the show is Harrow inserting broken glass into his shoes before stepping into them, which is symbolic of the internal pain and guilt he carries with him. It's fascinating because he claims to be this leader or servant of a noble cause, but he's really just doing it out of spite for Khonshu because of how Khonshu just left him for dead and moved on to leech off of Mark. So even separated from Khonshu, Harrow is still a slave to him, imprisoned by him in a sense, motivated largely, if not entirely, by how personal it's gotten. Whereas with Mark, he's acting to protect the ones he loves from receiving a similar fate, and whatever the cost may be, it's his cross alone to bear. Steven, very much the audience surrogate, is seeing from the outside looking in, seeing things for what they are, deeply messed up I might add, and Mark only truly grows, truly becomes better when he listens to Steven. Steven also learns from Mark. Just because he's the observer and even the person in the right doesn't mean he and Mark can't share their knowledge. The two have to learn to become one in order to free themselves from Khonshu. Because it's not about fixing him or ridding himself of all that makes him him, it's about embracing Mark, Steven, and Jake all in one, and learning that they are a part of him, and they are capable of extraordinary things without Khonshu. They don't need to fear one another or the great power they possess. Mark alone is not Moon Knight. They together are Moon Knight. The first half of Moon Knight is an awakening to an abuse of power, an overlord who controls the wants, desires, and free will of people in order to achieve his mission. Mark awakening to that abuse of power and servitude, and how that's being used to take advantage of his mental state. Even the gods don't trust Mark, and Harrow capitalizes on this, dismissing Mark as mentally unwell and creating the perfect scenario for his lies to be taken as truth. His exploitation to be taken as assistance. That's really profound and fascinating. The second half of this show, though, is even better, tackling something important without feeling like a heavy-handed tokenism-laden glance at a subject a la The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. The second half of Moon Knight is a commentary on self-acceptance and love, and how someone's mental disabilities aren't a curse. It's something that's a part of them and doesn't have to be destroyed in order for them to live a healthy and productive life. In fact, the answer isn't simply to vilify the condition, but rather seek to understand it. Get to the root cause so you can have power over it instead of it having power over you. Stephen Grant, in particular, is a lesson for us as an audience. 
His life is a living hell in the first couple of episodes, with no one supporting or listening to him, and it's only once people give him the benefit of the doubt that his situation and psyche begin to repair themselves. We have to listen to people when they say they need help. Our dismissal of genuine complaints or pleas for help is at least most of the problem, if not all of it. So often in society we think we know best for someone because they are mentally unstable, unwell, fractured but the reality is we don't have a one-size-fits-all solution to such varying degrees of instability. We don't have higher ground just because we're not struggling the way someone else may be. If anything, it's the opposite. They have something closer to a solution because they're directly, intimately familiar with the problem in a way that no other person can be, and our job is to listen and help them come to understand so that they can reclaim their life. That's Moon Knight. That is the power of this story, and that is why it ranks as one of the very best pieces of work the MCU has put out so far. We have these characters who are acting like they're the world's consciousness personified. Even in some ways, it's Doctor, but if you examine them, they're also broken people with a personal vendetta. Khonshu is a god who was basically cast out by the other gods, and his mission is all an attempt to reclaim his place amongst the gods by carrying out his will and proving to them that he has worth, all while feeding people lies that they're helping, that they have worth, but really are just pawns for Khonshu and his wishes. Mark, and by proxy Steven, fall into this trap as well, and it's only as they break free of it, ironically through Mark's death towards the end of episode 4, that either of them truly gain any agency in the story at the end. This ends up giving us the best episode to date of any MCU show, the fifth episode of Moon Knight titled Asylum. The episode is framed around a combination of Mark and Steven trying to find a way out of the transitional place between life and the afterlife that they've found themselves in, a psychiatrist personified in another version of Harrow dictating Mark's reality contrasting sense and nonsense. It's all symbolic of the mental health struggle that Mark has gone through in his life. Even the mythology adjacent part of this episode, the hippo guiding Mark and Steven through the afterlife with the imbalance of his and Steven's hearts combined, represents Mark's perpetual battle with Steven to control his being, and of the chaotic and traumatic experiences through which Mark created Steven in the first place. When Mark is being told that if the scales balance a soul may pass, he's really being told that in order to move on in peace, he must first come to terms with Steven. That doesn't mean getting rid of Steven, though. It means learning to find Steven's place within himself. Steven and Mark are two damaged halves of one man, and the reason their hearts don't balance together is because they're trying to exist separately, when the real solution is to merge the best parts of each of themselves into one. That's why when Steven falls into the duat and turns to sand, Mark's heart on its own finds balance. Steven isn't gone, per se, he's still with Mark. Mark created Steven, but he allowed Steven to take such firm roots in him over time that they became bound as one. What's especially brilliant about Asylum, though, is the way it brings Steven and Mark together. Rather than just have some generic expositional shouting match, they manipulate their circumstance, a combination of the afterlife and Harrow's psychiatrist persona attempting to subdue Mark's mind to create a living flashback, one where we learn how Mark's brother died in an accident, and Mark's mother resented him forever afterwards, becoming an abusive parent. Stephen pushes through the memories to learn what happens, despite Mark not wanting to relive it. Mark's creation of Stephen is revealed, the truth that Stephen was only ever in Mark's head, and that realization has a profound effect on Stephen. It's a deeply, emotionally rich storyline, and arguably the best that Moon Knight has to offer, and it cements a central idea behind the show. Mark needs Steven, and Steven needs Mark. Rather than Mark Spector manifesting the peace he always wanted but never had in the afterlife, or even worse, somehow finding a deus ex machina way to get back without Steven, he goes into the duot and rescues Steven, risking a complete self-sacrifice just so that Steven won't be alone. 
That is what brings Mark back to life. Just like how he has to accept that he and Steven are one in order for his heart to find balance, he cannot return to his corporeal form without bringing all of himself back. And that includes Steven. The finale of Moon Knight as a whole is really special. Layla bonding with Towerette to become her new avatar is an absolutely badass and monumental moment for Mena Egyptian representation as she beautifully becomes the embodiment of her father's name for her. Scarab. The Battle of Cairo happens because Mark, Steven, and Layla, even Khonshu to an extent, are all trying to save its populace from the judgment of Amit, which, at least in the context of the show, seems to operate on random chance as to whether any given person lives or dies. And when the final dissociative state of the show happens, and Mark suddenly defeats Harrow after it seemed like he was done for, we're treated to this brilliantly bold decision that wonderfully subverts the hero backed into a corner without hope cliché. What if the very thing that saves your life is this uncontrollable curse. It is the ruthlessness of Moon Knight. It is Jake Lockley. It didn't matter that we didn't see Moon Knight defeat the villain on screen because you know what? We'd already seen him exercise his mastery of abilities. Mark and Steven working together in perfect harmony in these amazing hand-to-hand -hand combat sequences and we know our hero is going to win. So why not get creative with it? Mohamed Diab sure as hell did, and it paid off in dividends. It was a nice moment that soon becomes even more satisfying at the end of the series. And it was placed perfectly because the scene afterwards, where Mark stands up to Khonshu and decides not to be his executioner, is the final piece of the puzzle for him to come to terms with himself and reclaim his life. Mark may have deluded himself into thinking he needed Khonshu in order to survive, the impetus for his years of servitude, but it was Steven who he needed. Steven who saved Mark's life. When Mark chooses not to kill Haro, he chooses love for Steven and the virtues he taught him. He's not a weapon, but a person, flesh and blood, free to make his own decisions, free to serve himself instead of another. Throwing down the blade and telling Khonshu to do it himself is Mark setting himself free. He's done being the trigger man for a master who's ultimately no better than the one he just saved the world from. And because Mark succeeds here, you almost forget that Jake is still there. Khonshu's ace in the hole. And when that post credit scene arrives, and it's confirmed that Khonshu has freed Mark and Steven at the cost of taking command of Jake, the real weapon inside of the body of Mark Spector, it's so fitting. Just because Mark had a breakthrough, a massive one, in his mental health fight, doesn't mean it's completely over. That fight will continue to go on, and it will be represented whenever the addition of his Jake personality rises to the surface. Phase 4 of the MCU so far has largely been about the reluctant hero. The hero born out of necessity or at least pressure. Sam Wilson being given Captain America's mantle, Wanda confronting a monster she herself created out of grief, Black Widow and Hawkeye becoming more than just weapons but heroes worthy of love and admiration. Moon Knight is just the most literal version of that. It's about a man who has lived as a mercenary, who arguably isn't a perfect human, who created an entire second personality in order to live life as a good, caring man, to bury his misdeeds. Ultimately, it's a show about Mark Spector learning to live with Stephen Grant's best qualities within himself, always rather than reverting entirely into being that person when it suits him when he wants to hide. His scars are all out in the open now. He knows who he truly is and has opened himself up to all facets of himself in order to heal. Of all the Disney Plus shows to date, Moon Knight probably has the most emotionally satisfying story and conclusion. Mark Spector and Stephen Grant earned their happy-ish ending and I was right there alongside with them. I had a complete smile on my face watching this finale and even perhaps shed a few tears. 
And with that teaser of what might come from Moon Knight moving forward in the MCU, I hope Mohamed Diab and Oscar Isaac return soon to give us season two, or, you know, a bunch of Moon Knight movies, because Moon Knight is worthy of the big screen treatment. To put it simply, Moon Knight is the crowning achievement of the MCU's phase four, and arguably one of the best MCU projects in general.